A few weeks ago, I finally got the chance to visit the Midwest Vintage Computer Festival in Schaumburg, Illinois, which was an incredible experience. And you can see that this place was absolutely buzzing, with so many people gathered to enjoy the incredible work and dedication of the exhibitors of this event. I've never encountered the classics like a deck PDP in real life, so seeing this straight eight with its gorgeous card array exposed, or these two PDP 8Es, was like a dream come true. And there was a ton of stuff from the 80s. Everything from Ataris to Commodores, and of course some celebrities like David Murray, better known as the 8-bit guy, and Adrian Black from Adrian's Digital Basement, showing off some of his famous repairs. Of course, the TRS 80s hold a special place in my heart, and there were plenty of cool customizations to see on these machines, like this working radio communications setup on a Model 1. And speaking of communications, there was also this interactive exhibit of an electromechanical phone exchange complete with Stroger switches, and you could actually dial up a number and see them in action. And while there was no shortage of familiar vintage computer brands, there were also some stunning homebrew machines, like this Magic One. And of course, I was very interested in getting some insights into how that front panel was put together. I also came across a couple of relay computer setups, like this single board relay computer, which is using some silicon for memory and interfacing. But what really caught my eye was this 4-bit homebrew relay computer designed and built by Stephen Fry, which also included a data console for entering and reading values, and uses a motorized cam and switches to generate the clock pulses. But what I found most interesting is that his design does not use any sort of RAM for program storage, but instead, a grouping of DIP switches is used to enter and store the current program. And this program's purpose was to send control signals to this little robot. And like most relay computers, it wasn't generating signals quickly, but it was still highly entertaining. There were so many things to see, and I am so glad that I had the two days to be able to explore it all. And before I left for the long drive home, I finished off with a look at some of my favorite electromechanical devices, these gorgeously restored and fully functional teletype machines. Which brings us to the subject of today's video, which is this Lorenz teletype machine. And this thing's a thing of beauty in my eyes. I don't know how old this machine is, although with a little bit of Google sleuthing, I determined it was manufactured in around the 1950s. And that would make it 70 plus years old. And further to that, it was sitting in a museum for years, unused, untouched. So I don't know the last time this machine was even serviced or lubricated or anything. So before I go on with trying to run this machine much further or interface it to anything, I need to show this machine a little bit of TLC. This machine sat in storage for a number of years, and fortunately it was stored inside this cabinet, so it was somewhat protected from the elements. And aside from some dust and what looks like cat hair, this machine is in pretty good shape, so I don't think I need to do anything extreme like a complete teardown or a soaking of this unit. The process I'm going to follow is really just a cleaning and following up with some oil along the way.
and I'll start with a gentle wipe down of the more obvious dust, and kind of use this to get to know the layout of the machine a bit better. And while I couldn't find the exact lubrication guide for this teletype, this one provides me some guidance on what areas to focus on, and it's quite the list with over 400 points that will need some form of lubrication. The oil I'm using is just standard sewing machine oil, and then I have some heavier grease for the main shaft gears. The keyboard unit is pretty easy to remove. Just two thumb screws, and then it slides right out. Removal of the printing unit is next, which is held in place with these two screws. And with that unit removed, we can see that the base is actually in pretty good shape. And I think that just some good old elbow grease is what's needed to clean this up. Back to the keyboard unit, I'm just using some cotton swabs with a touch of oil to loosen any buildup. And then it's just a matter of oiling anything that looks like it moves. The shafts also have these oil reservoirs, and this one was completely dry. Keyboards are always the worst when it comes to collecting hair and dust, and this one is no exception. As I added oil along these rails, I could really feel the keys starting to loosen up nicely. And while the keycaps aren't easily removable, I'm pretty thankful that the large spacing makes it really easy to get them shiny again. This keyboard mechanism is an incredible tribute to ingenuity because it's basically converting a completely mechanical operation into a digital serial output. And I can actually go through an example of this, starting with what happens underneath this unit. So with this flipped over, we can see on the bottom side that there's these levers uh, that go horizontally, and those are moving depending on which key on the keyboard is being pressed. And then we have these crossbars, and these get shifted up and down depending on, again, the key that's being pressed. And it's an ingenious method of producing a unique pattern here, depending on which of the keys on the keyboard is pressed. So for example, if I press any key on the other side, for example, we see that this is now shifted and has created a pattern. And if I move to another key, and I can't tell which keys I'm pressing on the other side, I'm just picking random ones, uh, we see that we have another pattern. Now, 
I can select a key that I do know if I just count down with kind of by feel here and I'll hit the D key, we see the D pattern. Now back on the top of the unit, because we had the D key pressed, a couple of things have happened here. And the first is that this clutch has engaged. So now we have the top half and the bottom half of the shaft tied together. And this bottom half has cams that are pushing these levers that will break contacts in sequence. And because of the key that was pressed, some of these levers are prevented from moving. And that's what creates our specific sequence of data that's being output in a serial manner to these contacts over here. And then once the character code has been output, we can see that the camshaft has been disengaged. Now just for fun, I've hooked up a multimeter, which is just set to measure continuity. And I've hooked it up to this serial out from the uh, keyboard unit. And right off the top, we can see we have our normally high signal, which is correct. So when I press D again, the clutch is engaged. And when we start to slowly rotate, we see that it immediately drops to a low, which is correct because the first cam has initiated this lever, which breaks the circuit and creates a mark or start pulse. And this tells the teletype on the other end that a new character is inbound. And when the shaft is rotated a bit further, we now see it go back to high, which is our first bit. And then we continue to the next two bits, which are both low. And then we hit a high bit. And finally a low bit before the clutch disengages and the send is complete. One last cool thing about this keyboard unit is this here is key which is basically a handshake function used to tell the teletype on the other end who you are. And when this here is key is pressed, it activates this rotating drum mechanism, which is like a sort of ROM or read-only memory, with each row of these teeth corresponding to a character code. So as the drum rotates, these levers bump up against the teeth, which creates the same effect as pressing certain keystrokes in a defined sequence. Now I took the liberty of decoding this particular drum, and it turns out that the station ID is AMBMTN. So once I had the station ID, I did some googling to see if there was any semblance of structure or standardization around how those IDs work, and also just try to uncover where this machine came from, but I really couldn't find anything. So I posed the question in my weekly Patreon update, and soon received this excellent and, I think, reasonable explanation, which is that this teletype machine may have been used for a newswire service in Binghamton, New York. So unlucky Fett, thank you so much for taking the time to dig into this and uncover a bit more about the history of this teletype machine. Now that the keyboard is cleaned up, it's time to work on the printing unit. And I'm just back to using the cotton swabs and oil to get rid of the more obvious gunk. This shaft's oil reservoir was bone dry and very thirsty, and it ended up gulping down several hits of oil. Once everything was cleaned up, it was time to put it all back together.
Next, it's time to tackle the replacement of this very dried out ribbon. And since this was my first time, I took it slow as I didn't want to accidentally mangle any of the mechanisms. And finally, I'm going to set up the modem, which I'm just using as a loopback so the teletype will operate like a glorified typewriter in order to test it. It's all back together and it's fully lubricated and cleaned up and has a shiny new ribbon so we can actually see what it is that we're printing. There are still some things to do on this machine like replacing some missing screws through to replacing these keyboard and printer lines that are in shockingly bad condition. I'm also going to get this TTY modem hooked up to some sort of feed. And if that goes well, then it's off to the races in terms of building an interface between the Relay computer and this teletype machine. But that is an adventure for another day. For now, this episode's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.